everyone. Today kicks off our third week of COVID-19 Power Lunch, our twice weekly video series that brings our professionals straight to you to discuss new developments and new legislation related to the coronavirus pandemic. We want to make sure we're covering topics that are relevant to you. If you have something specific that you'd like us to address during this series, please don't hesitate to email that to us at info at jmco.com. On the menu today is round two of the Paycheck Protection Program and other important updates. And with me today is Suzanne Forbes, CPA and Managing Partner of James Moore. Suzanne, Congress just passed a new bill to continue funding the Paycheck Protection Program. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, thank you, Erin. And uh, so on Friday, uh, the Congress passed the the expanded uh, payroll protection program under the CARES Act, and it became effective on Monday. That would be April 27th. The, um, it provides for a second round of funding for the payroll protection program. The third, first round of funding was for $349 billion, and this added $321 billion. So now there's $600, $670 billion of funding of this program. So the big issue was that the original funding it ran out of funds um, around April 16th, and a lot of businesses did not have their loans processed, which wasn't a surprise to most of us in the industry because we knew that there wasn't going to be enough funding with the first round. So this provides for a second round, and so the applications opened yesterday on Monday, and anybody that had had an application in process already with their bank should be hopefully being processed, as well as anybody that hasn't put an application and the, the new applications will be funded until that program runs out of money. Now that brings us to a lot, I think we've gotten a few questions like if, which you just answered that, hey, if I already have a pro, an application to process with my bank, are they gonna continue processing it as, as they have before? And from what we know, the SBA has directed banks, if they already have the application and all the information from their applicants to continue to process, no one needs to reapply. But is there a reason to maybe apply with a different bank if your bank hasn't processed your loan, or is that just kind of up to each um, borrower? I think it's really up to the borrower. I mean, at this point, if you have an application in, um, I mean, I professionally would tell you that you need to keep that would be the application you would go with. You'll probably have a better chance of getting it approved. Um, I will admit, though, that I do know some clients that have applied for more than uh, in more than one place and figured the first one they get. Um, I know there's also some online sources that people can apply, but generally, you know, you need to work with whatever bank you've already. I mean, if they've already got that loan application and process and you've already answered all the questions, they're going to be in the best position to be able to get it submitted as quickly as possible. But if you haven't submitted yet and you plan to, you need to do it quickly. Suzanne, I know one of the big issues is that Schedule C tax players or sole proprietors weren't even allowed to apply for this loan until Friday, April 10th, and the funds ran out shortly thereafter. Luckily, the SBA and Treasury has issued guidelines and regulations that told both the lenders and borrowers exactly the documentation needed in order to calculate the loan amount. And so even if you haven't applied yet, the guidance is out there and it hopefully should go as a much smoother, quicker process as these applications are processed with the SBA. Yeah, it was so, nice that we did get guidance for the uh, so the Schedule C's because uh, it was nice to be able to give to a client and say this, this is what you need to put together to submit. And actually the repayment on those those uh, returns are already uh, um, kind of laid out in, those gui in the guidance. So it's gonna be very helpful. Yeah, that's definitely on the loan forgiveness. They kind of encompass that all of the self-employed um, interim regulations. Now, I'm, I didn't see it, but I'm assuming you didn't either. I didn't see anything on the loan forgiveness calculations for those who've already gotten the money or how it will, will work. We're waiting guidance on that. Do we have any answers to some of our burning questions or what's kind of still out there? Well, I wish there was, Aaron, but unfortunately, we're all still waiting. I I don't think you missed it. I didn't miss it. I don't know anybody that's been looking. I've got you know people all across the the country looking to try to figure out whether or not what the provisions are. So we're still waiting. The key points we're waiting guidance on is we're waiting guidance on the calculation of a full time equivalent. We're trying to determine. Um, the even you know, some of the issues over the time period, if you just got your money now and, and you have your eight weeks running, but you laid people off and you know you can bring them back on. And then there's a date that says, you know, June 30th. So that means that they have to be employed on June 30th. 
we, you know, maybe that's outside your eight week period. What if your business isn't open yet? Can you delay that eight week period? Um, a lot of questions about related parties, you know, is there, are we sure that the owners are included or what about family members? And so unfortunately we have zero guidance out. Um, there's been nothing new that's come out from the SBA on the, ref the forgiveness calculation. My hope is that we have eight weeks and that hopefully in another week or two, the max, at least we have another four weeks to be able to help clients understand what they need to do because everybody that I've talked to wants to do the right thing. They want to make sure that the money is getting to the employees, that it's keeping them off of unemployment, that it's enabling them to work. Um, sometimes it may mean that they're not able to, um, there may not be work, but they're still on payroll. And that was the intent was to keep them on payroll Clients are being creative on things that they can do with people. Maybe um, maybe it is like learning social media or helping them um, even on a sales side or things like that so that it's not just um, you know, if they're if they're a restaurant, they don't need all those people there because they're only doing takeout. It's going to be hard to have you know all these employees, plus they might not be able to meet all the social distancing requirements. So Suzanne, on Friday, the SBA issued an additional frequently asked questions, which they seem to be updating every couple of days by adding one, two, or three questions. But the one on Friday was related to if you were eligible to take the PPP loan. I think that this came out of a lot of the press where some of the larger publicly traded corporations have been outed for taking these large loans that maybe took funding away from others. But this one seems to indicate, I mean, this frequently asked question seems to indicate that if you took the money out and you don't think that you now meet eligibility requirements to have it, you have until May 7th to return it. Can you shed a little bit of light on what they were trying to get at or if people need to be concerned about this? Sure, I'll, I'll do my best on that. So the when the, uh, when the original PPP loan came out, a borrower has to certify that there's economic uncertainty related to COVID-19. And that's a certification. There was no credit terms. There was, um, and actually one of the questions on the uh, PPP application, the frequently asked questions was, if um, do I have to exhaust all other borrowing resources to be able to get this loan? And the answer was no. They also specifically wrote in there that if you, uh, where a large company that had multiple locations in certain industries, particularly the hospitality industries, that you could do the employee count of 500 or less by location. So that opened up the door to the Ruth Chris of the world and all the big big companies, Shake Shack, and and um, because it was per location, not per um, per company. And um, so. You know, that was the original. I mean, if you go back to the original intent on this, I mean, I really think from listening to all of the committee reports and all the different you know, people that you listen to, the idea was, is this is in lieu of pretty much unemployment to put pe keep people on payroll. It was um, so there was no criteria for purposes of saying that you had to have a loss or you were going to, you know, all these different things. And so what's come out now is um, kind of, you know, in some ways, a clarification, I guess, but um, there, the appears the wording appears to be targeted to large companies. It says if your business is owned by a large corporation, that you have to consider whether you have access to capital markets. That if you had access to capital markets, that you uh, wouldn't qualify for this loan because you could access as capital mar markets without uh, damage to the business, I believe is similar wording like that, which um, I don't know how you can get capital funds from a capital market and raise capital if you're going to have losses and be able to, you know, um, not have damage to your business. But so that's now raised a lot of questions. Well, what if my business is operating now? But I foresee in the future, and I'll just use one industry, construction is a good example. Construction may be working, new home construction. They may be working right now because they have these contracts in process. But, you know, depending on how long the economy is shut down for or delayed, they will most likely see housing starts decline. And in the future, probably beyond the eight-week period, they're going to see a prob most likely a, a potentially a large uh, decline in their revenue. It's it's an economic uncertainty. They don't know whether they will, but because of this, but it's possible that they do. So um, so a lot of people now. So now they've come out with this question and said, uh, question 31. The interpretation is, uh, do you have economic uncertainty? 
So we've, we have gotten some calls from some clients asking, well, what does that mean? My business isn't shut down now, but I do, I'm having additional cost. I'm having supply chain interruptions. I can't get my inventory. Um, I've got customers canceling orders. So I have economic uncertainty. I just don't know if I'm going to be out of business without this loan. Right. And so, so what we're trying to tell them to do is just to go ahead and plan on documenting now right now because you have until may 7th to decide whether you're going to keep the money or not whether you know what your economic uncertainties are if you have emails from clients customers cut it, canceling orders if you're having problem getting inventory if your business is closed if you're seeing a reduction or you anticipate a reduction i think you know right get it documented now to make your assessment whether you feel like you have economic uncertainty related to uh, COVID-19. It's not a bright line test. I mean, the only bright line thing that was in there was the fact that if you're a own, business owned by a large corporation, that uh, you're supposed to exhaust uh, um, the capital markets first before, you know, that you would be unlikely to have economic uncertainty because you could have access to capital. A lot of businesses don't have access to capital right now because even if they had loans, they wouldn't be able to borrow other money because they have requirements on their debt. Um, covenants and they may not be able to meet them. So um, again, it's more guidance, but I think the guidance actually draws more questions. Seems to be the theme of this whole series. <laughs> it seems to be drawing more questions. So thank you for that. I know there's not, again, a bright line test and every business kind of has to look at their own situation and determine if they have until May 7th to return or whether or not they should. So let's talk about there's other avenues, though, I think, for different loans that you can have that have been put out through some of these, like the Main Street Lending Program, I think, is one. So there is other opportunities for businesses to borrow money that don't have, I don't want to call it these strings attached related to payroll and other costs, but they also don't have the forgiveness piece in there, correct? Correct. There are, um, everybody's focused on the Paycheck Protection Program because those loans are forgivable, meaning you don't have to pay the money back. So you borrow the money, typically in a loan, you borrow the money, you pay interest and you got to pay it back, right? Well, the PPP right. loan, if you meet those criteria, you don't have to pay it back. That's why it's getting all the press and stuff. But there are um, several other loans, SBA loans that they've put out there. I know um, there's a Main Street loan and I actually had to write it down because it was a little confusing to me, but there's an expanded loan and a new loan. So, um, and this is for businesses, I believe up to 10,000 employees and um, it's um, up to the, the, the smallest amount of loan is a million and I think it goes up to like 25 million. So these are big loans. They're loans that are over a four year period. Uh, they're fairly low interest. I think right now the interest rate runs two and a half to 4% and they are done through the bank and they are more of your traditional SBA loans, but they're um, more streamlined. So for yeah. businesses that need the cash flow, the funding, and uh, you know some businesses will be able to recoup some revenues in the future or they're not going to get a PPP loan because they don't meet the qualifications. So right now they're, you know, they've had to reduce their workforce and they've got to pay their overhead expenses to stay in, you know, stay in business when to be there when the economy reopens. So these are loans that they could be looking at to see how they um, might work with their business, you know, an existing um, one of the loans, I think the expansion loan, it helps you refinance some of your current SBA borrowings. And the other one is for new debt. So there's kind of two different loan programs that I'm aware of now call on the Main Street lending portions. Yeah. So again, another avenues that people need additional funding that again won't be forgivable, but hopefully is like you said more streamlined, i.e., easier to get the loan than the traditional going through a bank to get the loan type thing, and that may take a while. So that's good news. So there's a couple other things that came through the CARES Act that people that have had questions on, and the IRS or Department of Labor or SBA has continued to issue guidance, but this one is specific to payroll taxes. So as part of the CARES Act, there was a, an option in there for a deferral of payroll taxes, where basically the employer side of FICA, which is 6.2% up to the first, I think it's like $137,000 of an employee's salary, can be deferred so that you don't have to actually pay that into the payroll service. And I think it gets deferred over two years. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is a uh, payroll tax relief and yeah. um, and you're correct, it's, it's 6.2%. So it's the employer portion of payroll taxes and you can take those taxes that you would normally send to the IRS and you can defer them and not, and you can take, 
you know, so let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars. You could take fifty thousand dollars and pay it on December thirty first, twenty twenty one, and then the other fifty thousand dollars on December thirty first, twenty twenty two. So it's a deferral. Now the catch to it is that if you get a PPP loan, you can't defer these. The, the, the original wording was you couldn't defer the payroll taxes. The IRS has come out and clarified that it's only the payroll taxes, the employer payroll taxes that you incur once you get the loan forgiven. So it's after that date, that date moving forward. So if there, mm-hmm. that sounds like in theory, anything, I think it's March 26 forward yeah. until when you get the loan forgiven, which we know the loans won't be forgiven for at least eight weeks. And we don't know what that process will be. Um, those payroll taxes, you could uh, wait and not pay them to the IRS and defer them for two years. Um, you know, it's it's a little scary for me for, to tell employ, uh, clients not to pay their payroll taxes, but um, because what happens in, in the end of December 21, when if you don't have the money or now you've got this big liability out there, but right. uh, it is an option for, for businesses. I do want to caution that if you are using a payroll company or a leasing company, you need to make sure that you tell them um, if you have a PPP loan and so that they can, I'm sure they have boxes in their system that they need to mark and say, okay, this, you know, this payroll from this period is covered by PPP because they're the ones that are going to be doing this for you, doing your calculations. And you need to make sure you understand your calculations and you need to make sure you understand how much taxes you aren't paying in and what that liability might look like in two years. And, um, yeah. and you really have to work closely with your payroll department and or your payroll provider, your leasing company, anybody that's handling payroll. Yeah, because I know, especially on the on a small business side, a lot of times they're not looking at the details of what they paid in for their payroll taxes. They're relying on their payroll company to just take the money out of their bank account and pay it into the to the IRS. And so if the payroll company thought you wanted to defer those taxes, you could end up with a pretty big liability at the end of the year that you weren't even aware of. Right. Or even worse, if you chose to defer the payroll taxes and then you've got to tell them that you had a PPP loan and it got forgiven. And now now you're in violation of law. Now you can have all sorts of penalties and interest for not paying them in. So you're going to have to really, to your point, you have to be really careful. I actually haven't had too many clients that um, really want to do this. I think most um, employers are just, you know, they don't want to get crossed with the IRS on payroll taxes. And so, um, I mean, I think there'll be some circumstances, but um, I, I don't necessarily know that this is going to be widely used. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's a cash flow um, solver. It's not it's not saving any money. It's not permanent. It, all it is is cash flow savings at that point. But to your point, you have to have the cash in 2021 and 2022 to pay it, right? So that's yes. a big deal. Okay. Yes. And so then a couple of other things that came out of the CARES Act that give um, opportunity maybe for some individuals or businesses to get additional cash from tax savings were in there related to NOL carrybacks and I believe um, excess business losses. So prior to the TCJA being passed, which was enacted in 2018, you could carry back a net operating loss a few years and get money back on taxes that you had previously paid if you had a current year loss. The CARES Act changed that, which opened up kind of an opportunity for individuals or businesses to take a current year loss for 2019 or 2020 and carry it back and get some taxes. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Sure. The um, and, and you're right. It was a change in this CARES Act um, where now you can carry your losses back. It's it's actually twofold. One, yet there were limitations on losses in excess of a half a million. So if somebody had a, a business at a very large loss, the loss calculation was limited. So that has changed and you can only carry it forward. They're now allowing you to carry it back up to five years, which um, can be an immediate amended return, which interestingly enough, you can fax into the IRS. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, yeah. the amend, you, so you recalculate your loss for 2018. If you have a, two, a loss for 2019, you get you calculate that, and then you can carry it back and free up the taxes. The You basically act like the loss occurred in that year that you carry it back to. So if it's uh, 18, you carry back to 2013, you calculate your income and you subtract off 
the um, what the loss would have been, and, it, and you pay less taxes, and you can get that ta those taxes refunded. So there's two pieces of it. One is the limitation being removed, and two, the carryback period, which they did this, and I'm trying to remember what, I think it was during the recession, we had some, it was generally, I think, a three-year carryback, and then we were able to go back five years, and so this isn't the first time they've allowed an extended, extended carryback period, and um, so it is definitely anybody that has uh, losses from 18 or 19, and, and I believe it applies for 20 when we get into 20, which will be a big help for, you know, what's going on in 20, where you see a lot of businesses having losses that they'll be able to carry those back once the year's done, and we, the calculations are done. Yeah, and like you said, it is interesting. You can fax it into the IRS, which a lot of people are like, fax, okay. But it is much quicker. Um, the, they, the IRS has kind of promised they'll speed these through to get people the cash back. And the other interesting thing related to this is, if, for those who don't remember, the tax rates change from 17 to 18. So the availability to carry it back five years may mean that you're going to use a loss that was at a lower tax rate that you're carrying forward, and you're going to get a tax back at maybe the higher tax rate. So it's a good, so it, it could be a good thing some additional work needed on that and then the second thing is related to they finally went back and made a technical correction that we've been waiting on um, since they passed the TCJA which allowed if you put certain improvements into property I'm um, sorry certain improvements to your property into service that under the special provision was automatically at 39 years but not allowed to have bonus depreciation they went back and fixed that as well so those people who have been waiting on that technical correction so they could get that one uh, 100% bonus depreciation now have that opportunity, correct? Yes, and that's really important because maybe you didn't have a loss because you put in $100,000 of improvements and you had to write them off over 39 years, so yeah. you don't have much of a deduction. And now under this correction, that $100,000 could be written off 100% in 2018 or potentially 2019, which might now put you in a loss situation. So right. those, so that's definitely something to look at for anybody that made improvements to property that was placed in service. And, and that needs to be improvements to the interior of a property. The exterior improvements don't qualify. So um, it's, it's really geared to like the inside of a building. And it, there's some exceptions because, you know, every, there's always for every rule, there's an exception, but it's a big area that could free up a big deduction and one either reduce your taxes that you paid in 18 or 19 or um, carry them create a loss and carry it back yeah uh, we I remember last year when we were doing through tax season we kept waiting for this technical correction to come out so we could actually implement it on the 18 returns that it never did so I'm glad they finally fixed it because they definitely everybody acknowledged that it was incorrect in the original law so now it's fixed and like you said providing opportunity for perhaps a loss that you can carry back and get it at a high tax rate so is there anything else that you think that um, someone may want to know or anything you want to talk about with the page um, in addition to the Paycheck Protection Program? I know one of the last things that, um, that had come up was an additional ruling that came out, I think, again, last week that talked about eligible people. So people who were eligible. This is separate from the frequently asked questions, but there have been a lot of questions related to hedge funds hospitals, whether or not they were eligible for the PPP program. And I think this additional regulation kind of kind of silenced those, correct? Yes. And I think if I remember correctly, it came out from the Treasury. It didn't come out from the SBA. So it's, you That's know, we're right. looking we're looking all these different places to find regulations that are being you know done overnight and yeah. it primarily was focused towards um hedge funds and private equity firms to see whether they qualified um yeah. to be able to qualify for the payroll protection program and the answer was basically no um there was also some um things related to gambling because there were specific businesses that were excluded from the um, payroll protection program and i think the, the question addressed gambling not not all of them um so though yeah so i don't see a lot of relevance to it um mm -hmm. but it, it's out there so if there's a specific industry that was excluded it may be worth looking at the the uh, treasury uh regulation that came out on that um, but you know yeah. other than that actually unfortunately i think they were so focused on getting the expansion on the payroll protection program we just didn't get a lot of guidance last week like we were hoping for um you know just you know telling people do the, you know do the best you can right now we've got you know we've got some time to be able to help 
figure out when the guidance does come out, what we need to do. I think why, you know, I know I've talked to three clients this morning already about, you know, what do I do? And, and they understand we don't have the answers. We're trying to give them educated guesses. And so, you know, right now it's, it's like, well, <laughs> we yeah. think, don't know, no guarantees. But uh, but as soon as we get guidance, you know, we'll be there to to make sure everybody's aware of it and try to help everybody. Yeah, again, I think you're right. Most, um, most of not all companies want to do the right thing. They just don't want to be caught, get caught by surprise at the end of the eight weeks. So that's understandable. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. As I mentioned at the beginning, we come on twice weekly, Tuesday and Friday, and we are available to answer your questions through the live chat and comments. And if you have um, additional topics that you'd like us to address, please email them to info at jmco.com. Thanks, Suzanne, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing everyone again. All right, have a great day.